welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow, and this is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire, and Episode 42, The Yaroslavichi. So, here we are with the Yaroslavichi, who are also Vladimirovichi. Hopefully, no one will find that too confusing. Just remember that Ovich or Vich means son of. The Vladimirovichi are the wider ruling clan of Rus, and the other Ovichi, the Yaroslavichi, the Mstislavichi, and so on, are the individual ruling families within the clan each named after the king who established their right to rule. The post-Yaroslav period appears to open quite peacefully, with the sons following the allocations made in the testament. The tale tells us that Izyaslav sets up in Kiev, Svetoslav in Chernihiv, Sivolod in Periyaslavl, Igor in Vladimir and Vyacheslav in Smolensk. None of them makes any immediate move against each other, which is not to say that this is a period without conflict. The second half of the paragraph describing the brothers setting up in their own fiefdoms goes on, quote, In this year, Sivolod attacked the Torks during the winter near Voin and conquered them. In the same year, Borlish advanced with his Polovsians, but Vsevolod made peace with them, and they returned whence they had come. End quote. The Polovsians, or Polovsi, are a major new entrant in our story. They will get a dedicated episode of their own soon, but for now what you need to know is that Polovsi is the Slavic word for people who are called Cumans further west and Kipchaks to the east. The Cumans and the Kipchaks were two Turkic tribes that formed a confederation in the western part of the steppe between the 10th and the 13th centuries. The area they ruled was referred to as Cumania in western sources, the Dashter Kipchak or Kipchak steppe in Persian, and the Polovtsian steppe, or Polovtsian plain, in Russian. The confederacy was nomadic, so this area gets defined somewhat differently depending on the source, but with some variation over time they dominated what is now Kazakhstan, southern Russia and Ukraine, Moldova and eastern Romania. As you will already be used to from the other steppe confederacies that we have seen, their sedentary neighbours would also refer to other ethnic groups incorporated into the confederacy as Cumans or Parlovsians. Like the Pechenegs, this pre-Mongol Kuman Kipchak confederacy was not ever politically centralised and cannot be regarded as either a state or an empire. Different peoples within the confederation acted largely independently under their own khans and interacted in trade, conflicts and alliances with their sedentary neighbours in Rus, Central Asia, Byzantium, the Balkans and Hungary. There's a bit of a shakeout in the family. Yaroslav's eldest son had died a couple of years before he did. Vyacheslav died a couple of years later, in 1057. This opened up a space in Smolensk, and Igor was transferred in from Vladimir in Volinia. He only lasted until 1060. Meanwhile, Uncle Sudislav, remember him, Yaroslav's last surviving brother, was let out of his prison on condition that he became a monk which he did and lived in a monastery until his death in 1063. This left three, Izyaslav, Sviatoslav and Psyavolod, 
ruling in Kiev, Chernihiv, and Pereyaslavl, a fairly tight cluster of domains on the Dnieper. The brothers made an effort to present themselves as living in harmony in accordance with their father's wishes. The bishops of Chernihiv and Pereyaslavl were given the title of Metropolitan, although they had none of the authority that went with it and certainly no ability to appoint subordinate bishops. Pereyaslavl was a smaller fish than either Kiev or Chernihiv, so Vsevolod was also given the tribute from Smolensk after Iga's death. They also worked together on a combined expedition by, the tale says, horse and ship, against the Aarhus Turks, who fled rather than fight, creating more room for the Polovsi to expand into. In 1072, the brothers gathered for the consecration of a new church, intended to be the final resting place of their family martyrs, Baris and Gleb. All the prominent churchmen of Rus were gathered, and Isiaslav, Sviatoslav, and Sievolod carried the relics of Baris on their shoulders, surrounded by monks and priests. When they came to the church, they opened the casket, and it was miraculously filled with a sweet fragrance, the tale of bygone years tells us. But ruling brothers rarely managed to live in peace for long. Straight after the internment of the martyred brothers, the tale continues. The devil stirred up strife among these brothers, the sons of Yaroslav. In fact, while this core trio in the Dnieper heartland had been managing more or less to get along, the peace had already been disturbed around the periphery. This is going to get a bit complicated. It can get quite hard following all the names on paper. Listening will probably be worse. For a taster, take this excerpt from the tale. Quote, 1064. Rostislav, son of Vladimir and grandson of Yaroslav, fled to Tmutorokan, and with him fled Pare and Vishata, son of Ostromir, the general of Novgorod. Upon his arrival, he expelled Gleb from Tmutorokan and occupied his kingdom himself. In 1065, Sviatoslav then marched against Rostislav in Tmutorokan, so that the latter withdrew from the city, not because he feared Sviatoslav, but because he was reluctant to take up arms against his uncle. Upon his entry into Tmutorokan, Sviatoslav re-established his son Gleb upon the throne and returned home. Rostislav returned, however, and expelled Gleb, who rejoined his father while Rostislav remained in Tmutorokan. End quote. There's going to be quite a lot of this kind of musical chairs, and some of it is hard to sort out from the chronicler's editorialising. Was Rostislav really reluctant to fight his uncle, sort of trying to take his city away but still comply with Yaroslav's directive to live in peace? I kind of doubt it myself. But the important action kicks off in the next paragraph, which starts, In this year, Vsyaslav began hostilities. Do you remember Vsyaslav, son of Bratislav of Polotsk? Vsyaslav was a great-grandson of Vladimir the Great, but Polotsk had been going its own way even back then. When the wars of succession followed Vladimir's death, Bratislav did not get involved. When Yaroslav and Mstislav divided Rus among themselves, Polotsk was not on the table. Yaroslav did not manage to subjugate it, and when Bratislav died, the throne passed to his son, without Yaroslav being able to intervene. Polotsk was not mentioned in the testament because the Yaroslavici did not claim it. By this point, 
Polotsk had extended its rule south along the western Dvina to include Vitebsk and Minsk. It had a bishop and a cathedral dedicated to St. Sophia, just like Kiev and Novgorod, and if you are familiar with the geography of the region, you might notice that it covered roughly the territory of what would become Belarus. But on the other hand, Polotsk still had a lot in common with the rest of Rus. It had the same combination of Scandinavian, Slavic and Baltic people, familial connections, common trade interests, and its position outside Rus was seen as somewhat anomalous. And they did sometimes join together to fight against the steppe. Sieslav, however, seems to have had ambitions beyond being a junior partner to his larger neighbour, and after an unsuccessful attack on Pskov in 1065, he captured Novgorod during the winter of 1066 to 1067. It's a thin line between love and hate, and the closer people are to begin with, the worse enemies they become afterwards. And we can see that with the tale's treatment of Psyaslav, who it turns into a real bogeyman. Our first encounter with Psyaslav was a mention of his birth a couple of episodes back, where the tale says that he was born in a call and this was a sign that he would be surrounded by bloodshed. Now, the tale states, in this same year, the Volkov at Novgorod flowed backwards for five days. This was not a favourable portent, since Vsyaslav burned the city four years later. After announcing that Vsyaslav has launched hostilities, the tale continues, quote, At the time, there was a portent in the west in the form of an exceedingly large star with bloody rays which rose out of the west after sunset. It was visible for a week and appeared with no good presage. Much internal strife occurred thereafter, as well as many barbarian incursions into the land of Rus. For this star appeared as if it was made of blood, and therefore portended bloodshed. End quote. I know I said we were transitioning from the age of legend into the age of history in the tale, but it is still the Middle Ages. It goes on. At this time, a child was cast into the settlement. Some fishermen pulled it up in their net. They gazed upon it until evening, when they cast it back into the water because it was malformed. Indeed, it had privates for a face, and for reasons of modesty, no further account need be given regarding it. End quote. Does that seem a bit much? It goes on like that for a couple more pages. There are armed men riding around Jerusalem, a star like a spear, a star emitting rays, a shower of stars. The sun goes out, a child is born without eyes or hands and with a fish's tail. Dogs have six legs, children have two heads, more stars fall, earthquakes split the land, a mule appears speaking in a human tongue. In case you are in any doubt, the chronicler notes that all these are signs of evil significance, presaging the appearance of war, famine, or death. The chronicler really does not like Sieslav. Anyway, Sieslav took Novgorod. As you've probably noticed, Novgorod had been treated pretty much since the beginning as directly linked to Kiev. It had been given to the eldest son of the ruler, and the ruler of Novgorod had quite often ended up ruling Kiev. Yaroslav's testament does not assign Novgorod to anyone because it gave Izyaslav Kiev, and that meant that he got Novgorod along with it. Izyaslav had given the city to his son, Mstislav, born sometime in the year 1050s, thereby continuing the tradition. So, Sieslav must have known that he was getting into something serious when he burned and looted the city, stole the bells from the Church of St. Sophia, and carried them back to his own Church of St. Sophia in Parlotsk. According to legend, 
Mstislav could hear the bells ringing in Kiev where he had fled. What might have made Vsyaslav do this? Well, his northern cities had an economy clearly oriented to the Baltic rather than the Volga or Dnieper trade. Novgorod, you recall, was a gateway connecting the Baltic to the river trade. Taking Novgorod would split the lands of Rus, giving Vsyaslav the whole of the Baltic-focused northern region. As an idea, it seemed like a viable play for a larger kingdom. But the Yaroslavichi turned out to care much more about ruling Novgorod than they did about ruling Polotsk, and they were not ready to let it go. They quickly marched on Minsk. After a short siege, they took the city, put the male population to the sword, and sold the women and children into slavery. Then they continued on to meet Vsyaslav at the Nimiga River. In a major battle with heavy casualties, Vsyaslav and his brothers were victorious and Vsyaslav fled. A few months later, on 10th of June, they agreed a formal truce, sealing the deal by kissing a cross to swear peace to each other. Vsyaslav invited Vsyaslav to visit him in Smolensk and then betrayed his oath on the cross by seizing and imprisoning him, along with two of his sons. Meanwhile, the situation was deteriorating in the south. The brothers' defeat of the Orhus had created a power vacuum on the steppe, allowing the Polovtsi to push further west. When they first attacked in 1062, they had defeated Psyevolod in a minor skirmish. Now they came in force. In 1068, the Bolovti entered Rus from the southeast and defeated the combined forces of the Yaroslavichi on the Alta River, a key strategic point in the defensive system Vladimir and Yaroslav had built. Falling back from here left the core cities exposed. The tale treats this as God's punishment for the Rus flouting the cross-kissing. As it says, God in his wrath causes foreigners to attack a nation, and then, when its inhabitants are thus crushed by the invaders, they remember God. And the chronicler, as usual, rambles on for a couple of pages of biblical quotes and murmurings about the devil. Sviatoslav retreated to Chernikiv. Sievolod was cut off from Periaslavl and joined Izyaslav in Kiev. The retreat triggered a panic among the townspeople, who had probably got used to thinking that they were living in safety and fighting was something that happened elsewhere. The Vesh, the representative body of the townspeople, gathered to demand that Izyaslav go and take the battle to the Polovtsians. He did not even come out of his chambers to talk to them. So they went and got someone who would. They stormed the prison where Vsyaslav was being held, carried him to the palace courtyard and proclaimed him the ruler of Kiev before looting the palace. With his royal city in revolt and steppe invaders roaming his land, Vsyaslav fled to his nephew-in-law, Bolesław II of Poland. In the event, the Polovsi did not attack Kiev and the following year, with Polish backing, Izyaslav was on the march back to claim his city. Izyaslav clearly decided that he would not be able to rely on the people of Kiev if it came to a fight, and he fled at night back to Polotsk, leaving the people of Kiev to explain themselves to Izyaslav. The people of Kiev guessed that might go badly, and sent a messenger to Sviatoslav, saying, we did wrong in expelling our king, and now he leads the Poles against us. Return to your father's city, or we will have to burn the city and flee to Greece. Sviatoslav reassures them. We shall communicate with our brother. If he marches upon you with the Poles to destroy, we shall fight against him and not allow him to destroy our father's city. If his intentions are peaceful, then he shall approach with a small troop. 
Izislav received the message that the city would not oppose him, left his army and continued to approach with Boleslav and a small escort. He set up camp outside Kiev and sent his son Mstislav, who Vsyaslav had driven out of Novgorod, to deal with the city. Mstislav executed the 70 ringleaders who had freed Vsyaslav and blinded and killed many more for good measure. The city then welcomed Izyaslav back to sit on his throne on 2nd of May. The interlude had been brief, but the problem with fleeing your city because the people have revolted is that it establishes a precedent that the people can revolt and pick a new king. This was a good reason for the tale's hyperbole about Vsyaslav, the talk of omens and supernatural birth that suggests he and his actions were outside of the natural course of events. From Yaroslav's death to the Mongol conquest, Vsyaslav was the only non-Yaroslavich to rule in Kiev. The chronicler wanted to be sure that his readers did not draw the wrong conclusion from this political deviation. But at the same time, there is the problem that Vsyaslav had kissed the cross to swear peace, and then it had been Izyaslav who betrayed him. This made Vsyaslav the victim, and Izyaslav someone who had transgressed against God. Cross-kissing was an important ritual at the time, like swearing with your hand on the Bible became in other places. Izyaslav was the first recorded oath-breaker after a cross-kissing in Rus. Despite this sticky issue, Vsyaslav's evil nature became his prevailing characteristic, both in the tale and in folk culture. He's found in a number of Bellini, the medieval epic poems. In the Song of Eagles campaign, he is repeatedly referred to as a werewolf, racing from one place to the next pillaging the cities of Rus. In another Bellini, he became Volk Vsyaslavich. Volk were the priests of the pre-Christian Slavic religion. In these tales, Vsyaslav was the son of a serpent and the princess Martha Vsyaslavovna, a sorcerer who could transform himself into various animals. The toleration for independent Polotsk did not survive Vsyaslav. When he died, his realm was divided among his sons, which diminished its strength and therefore the threat that it represented. By 1119, Sievolod's son, Vladimir Monomach, would defeat and subjugate them. As you have probably all realized, while Izyaslav suffered from his war with Vsyaslav and was undoubtedly weakened by his flight to Poland, his brothers were much less affected, and that meant a shift in the balance of powers. While Izyaslav's troubles had started with him refusing to fight the Polovtsi, Sviatoslav had in fact fought and defeated them. This surely made him look good in any comparison with Izyaslav, and he felt strong enough in his position to warn the returning Izyaslav against taking excessive retribution against the people of Kiev. He had even gone so far as to install his own son Gleb in Novgorod, where he stayed even after Mstislav had returned to Kiev with his father. This was the first recorded case of someone other than a representative of Kiev being made the ruler of Novgorod. Gleb was more successful at defending his city than Mstislav and defeated another attack by Sieslav. Izyaslav also seemed to be one of those people who finds it difficult to get along with people. He argued with Nikon, one of the elders of the Monastery of the Caves, who moved to Tmutarakan and set up a new monastery, where he represented Sviatoslav. Izyaslav accused Antony, 
the most venerable of the monks of the Monastery of the Caves, of sympathy for Sviatoslav, and he also left to join Sviatoslav and founded a new monastery in Chernihiv. But the three brothers managed to scrape through a couple of years in peace and harmony, including their get-together to transfer the remains of Gleb and Baris to their new resting place. The tale fills a couple of pages here with stories about famine, apparently caused by magicians. The food shortages hit in the east, along the Volga. For reasons the tale doesn't see any need to explain, the people bring their womenfolk to these magicians, and the magicians stab them to death and draw grain and fish from the wounds. The magicians travel along the river, and by the time they reach Bielozera, they have gathered 300 men. Here they run into Jan, son of Fischata, who is out collecting tribute for his grandfather, Sviatoslav. The people tell him how the magicians had been killing people along the Volga, and Jan demands that they surrender the magicians to him. The people refuse, and Jan goes after the magicians himself with 12 of his own men. After a brief but inconclusive fight in which Jan's priest is killed, the magicians flee into the forest. Jan returns to the town and threatens to stay there for a year if the people do not hand him over to magicians. That's a serious threat, as the people would have been responsible for hosting him and his band as long as they were there, and that could get pretty expensive. Not to mention the inevitable fights between the townspeople and, and Jan's Drujina. Suitably concerned, the people captured the magicians and brought them to Jan. He asks them, why have they been killing the people? And they declare that there are too many people, they've become a burden on the land. If they are killed, abundance will return. They offer to extract grain and fish from the bodies for him. Jan says this is a lie, as God made man out of earth, and the body consists of bones and veins. The magicians tell Jan that they know how man was made, and Jan asks them how. They answer, quote, God washed himself in the bath, and after perspiring, dried himself with straw and threw it out of heaven down to earth. Then Satan quarreled with God as to which of them should create man out of it. But the devil made man, and God set a soul in him. As a result, whenever a man dies, his body goes to the earth, and his soul to God. End quote. Jan asks them which God they believe in, and what do you know? They tell him it's the Antichrist. After a brief debate about Jan's jurisdiction, he decides to punish them. First their beards are torn out, then they are bound across the thwarts of boats. Jan asks them where their gods are, and they reply that their gods have told them that they will not get out alive. After telling them that they are entirely correct about that, Jan asks who in the crowd has suffered at the hands of the magicians. He hands them over to the volunteers, telling them to avenge their kin. The people seize the magicians and hang them from an oak tree. At night, a bear comes and eats them. As the tale notes, if they had really known the future, they never would have turned up there in the first place. The chronicler obviously feels that this is an important story. Not only is it told at length, but it's also followed by a couple more pages discussing who magicians are and where they come from, as well as throwing in a brief anecdote about another magician in Novgorod. Of course, there were no actual magicians roaming medieval Rus, which makes it a little difficult to pin down what was actually going on. Famines were a fact of life until the development of modern farming. Populations were locked in a constant Malthusian battle with resources. If you remember all the way back to the beginning, this part of the world gets most of its precipitation in the winter, and relies on the meltwater flowing south along its great rivers to sustain life. A dry winter and a hot summer could easily trigger shortages. 
A wet winter and summer could cause flooding that destroyed crops. Life was precarious, and there was nothing unusual in the Rus seeking supernatural causes for climatic variations and natural disasters. Scholars speculate that these stories reflect difficulties that were encountered spreading Christianity into the Rus hinterland, where any flood or famine could be blamed on abandoning tradition, and the missionaries would have had to constantly compete with local beliefs and practices. Less than a year after the reinternment of Baris and Gleb, the tale continues. Quote, the devil stirred strife among these brothers, the sons of Yaroslav. When disagreement thus ensued among them, Sviatoslav and Sievolod united against Izyaslav. Izyaslav left Kiev, and Sviatoslav and Sievolod arrived there on March 22nd and established themselves on the throne, thus transgressing against their father's injunction. Sviatoslav was the instigator of his brother's expulsion, for he desired more power. End quote. According to the tale, Sviatoslav tricked Sievolod into joining him by saying that Izyaslav had allied himself with Sieslav to expel the brothers. The tale inveighs against Sviatoslav. While a full-throated attack on Sieslav was hampered by his victimhood in the cross-kissing case, there are no mitigating factors for Sviatoslav. He has broken the command of his father and of God, a great sin like the sons of Ham who were chastised by God, like Esau the son of Jacob who broke his father's command and suffered death. For it's not good to encroach upon another's possessions. Despite this, it's noticeable that the tale does not mention any actual opposition to Sviatoslav taking over, whether from the people of Kiev or anyone else, maybe because Izyaslav had already discredited himself enough that it was understandable. All there is is some churchmen preaching against him, which Sviatoslav just ignores. The tale continues with a long digression about the death of Theodosius, prior of the Monastery of the Caves. I told you that being written by monks brings a certain view of what's important information to the tale, and this is yet another example. The wives of kings need no name, princesses are given in marriage and never mentioned again until they die, but previously unmentioned monks get their entire life story inserted in this case running to almost 10 pages, more space than any of the Yaroslavici get to themselves. We return to the narrative to find Sviatoslav dead, apparently from an infected wound. He was buried in the Church of the Redeemer in Chernihiv, and on January 1st, Sivolod succeeded to his throne. Even the tale treats Sviatoslav's accusations of Izyaslav's treacherous alliance with Vsyaslav as improbable, but it does not provide an actual reason for his actions, beyond wanting power, or why there was so little opposition. Historians have suggested a few reasons. First, religious. Were Izyaslav's Polish connections leading him to changing his church allegiance? When Sviatoslav took Kiev, Izyaslav had once again fled to Poland. Boyaslav II was less inclined to help this time, although he did take Izyaslav's money. Izyaslav moved on to Henry IV in Mainz, and then sent his son Yaropolk on an embassy to Rome to ask Pope Gregory VII to support him in his claims. Some historians have seen this as indicating that he was aligning himself with the Catholic Church. But as we've said previously and heard from Christian Raffensperger, 
This is an anachronistic approach, reading the later conflict between the churches back into a period where it did not actually exist. We do not have any evidence that there was a stigma attached to the Catholic Church in Rus at this time, and therefore it seems unlikely that this could have been a strong enough reason for Sviatoslav's actions, even if there was some dissatisfaction over his flirtations with the Western Church. Simple greed and lust for power is always a potential explanation for any king breaking an agreement. Kiev was the wealthiest city of Rus, all contemporary sources agree. German and Polish chroniclers also agree that Kiev was incredibly rich. Adam of Bremen compared it to Constantinople. Henry IV's envoy to Sviatoslav said that he had an incalculable amount of gold and silver, and the bribe that Sviatoslav sent to Henry IV to dissuade him from supporting Izyaslav was described as more gold and silver and fine garments than had ever been brought into the German kingdom at one time. We should keep in mind that, although our narrative at this time might give an impression of lurching from one succession crisis to another and near-continuous warfare, that's merely because that's what the chroniclers of the time paid attention to. Out in the general population, Rus was booming. For me, the most plausible explanation is that Sviatoslav and Sievolod and the people of Kiev lost confidence in Izyaslav's competence. He had abandoned the fight against the Polovtsi to hide in his palace, been turfed out by his own townspeople and forced to rely on foreign assistance to hold his throne. Sviatoslav had successfully defended his people, so even if there was muttering about the sinfulness of taking his brother's domain, everyone was willing to go along with it. But this did not make it a deal that would survive Sviatoslav's death. Within a few months of Sievolod taking the throne, Izyaslav was leading a Polish army back into Rus. Sievolod declined the fight, and Izyaslav returned to the throne in Kiev for the third time. However, this did not mean that peace was restored. Sviatoslav was dead, and that meant deciding who succeeded to Chernihiv. As far as Izyaslav and Sievolod were concerned, the answer was Sievolod. This was in full accordance with the traditions of lateral succession and seniority. But Sviatoslav had adult sons, and one, Alirg, declared that Chernikov was the throne of his father and therefore should pass to him. Although it's not entirely clear whether Alirg was the eldest of the Sviatoslavici, his less ambitious brother David could have been, it's clear that both his and Sievolod's claims were strong and both could argue that they had the support of custom and the principles of the testament. Aleg went south to Tmu Torakan. Izyaslav and Sielod drove his brother Gleb out of Novgorod, and he died of his wounds soon after. Izyaslav's son Sviatopolk took over, restoring the traditional link to Kiev. In the south, Alerg entered an alliance with the Polovtsi and then moved to the north, defeating Sevolod and advancing on Chernihiv. Sevolod sought the aid of his brother and Izyaslav was reassuring. Quote, brother, do not sorrow. Do you not see what misfortune has happened to me? Did they not first expel me and confiscate my possessions? And what was later my second fault that I was driven out by you? my own brethren. Have I not wandered through foreign lands and suffered the loss of my estate? I had done no wrong. Let us therefore not give way to sorrow now, my brother. We shall each of us have his share in Rus, and if we lose it, then I am ready to lay down my life for you. End quote. So, pure fraternal friendship, 
and not at all the desire to take revenge on Sviatoslav's sons for his humiliation. The brothers ordered the warriors to gather and set out. Izyaslav was accompanied by his son, Yaropolk, and Sevalod by his son, Vladimir Monomach. The brothers attacked and burned Chernihiv, and then advanced towards Alek and his brother, Boris. Alek wanted to withdraw, arguing that the two of them could not possibly face four, that's Izyaslav, Sevalod, Yaropolk, and Vladimir. Boris declared that he would fight them all, and the forces moved to meet on the Nizhatin meadow. Boris was the first to die, which the tale presents as the consequences of his prideful boasting. Then Izyaslav, standing with his foot soldiers, was struck down by a warrior on horseback. Remarkably, despite all the wars we've been discussing, he was the first ruler of Kiev to die in battle since Sviatoslav was killed by the Pechenegs, and the only one who ever died fighting his own kin. Alek fled from the battle back to Tmutarakan, and that meant that Sievolod was the last man standing of the sons of Yaroslav. This outcome left Sievolod and his two sons, the adult Vladimir Monomach and eight year old Rostislav reasonably secure in the kiev chernihiv Piryaslavl heartland and with control over Smolensk. But outside of that core, the wider clan was an obstacle to him re-establishing the sole rule of Yaroslav. This was more of a problem than it might have seemed at first glance because it left his realm landlocked and meant that the trade routes running in and out of it passed through potentially hostile territory. Alieg remained the biggest problem. Not only did he control Tmutarakan, the key link to Byzantium in the south, where he felt secure enough to start issuing his own coinage, he also maintained his claim to Chernihiv. Sivalod took an indirect approach to solving the problem. First he paid some Polovtsi to murder another brother, Roman Sviatoslavovich, as he was travelling. Then he paid some Khazars to capture Oleg and ship him to Constantinople. Then he installed his own man in Tamu Khan. This did not hold for long. A couple of other Yaroslavichi who had dropped out of the succession line when their fathers died too soon to rule, Izyaslav's nephew David Igorovich and great-nephew Volodar Rostislavich, staged a takeover to grab Tmutarakan for themselves. Meanwhile, Alyek Sviatoslavich was off in Byzantium. Details are scant as usual. We don't know whether the Byzantines gave him refuge as exiled royalty or were holding him at the request of Sivalod, whose wife, who the chroniclers once again see no reason to mention, was a member of the Byzantine ruling family. He appears to have spent a couple of years in Rhodes. Some have claimed that he married a Byzantine aristocrat. Whatever the case, after a few years, a new emperor released him and he returned to retake Tmutarakan. He took revenge on the Khazars who had kidnapped him, but he let David and Volodar leave freely. In the north, Sivalod was more successful at reaching an accommodation with the sons of Izyaslav, at least to begin with. He confirmed their rights to the cities they held at their father's death, Sviatopolk in Novgorod, Yaropolk in Vladimir and Volinia. But in 1085, Sievolod fell out with Yaropolk for reasons the tale does not choose to get into, merely stating that evil advisers supposedly incited Yaropolk to attack Sievolod without any mention of what the aim might be. So Vladimir Monomach is sent to attack him. 
Jaropolk makes the traditional flight to Poland, and Sivolod gives Vladimir in Valinia to David Igorovich. This state of affairs is short-lived, as Jaropolk resolves his dispute with Vladimir Monomach. Monomach returns to Chernikiv, and Jaropolk returns to Vladimir in Volinia. Shortly thereafter, he sets off for Zvenigorod by sled, and along the way, a man named Nyradets, for no reason other than being incited by the devil, kills him. The dying Yarapolk pulls the sword from his body and cries out, Ah, enemy, you have caught me. I told you this was going to get into a complicated game of musical chairs, but bear with me, we're approaching the end. Nyradets flees to Rurik in Perimishul. Yarapolk's men carry his body to Kiev, where he's buried with all honour. Vladimir in Volinia is given back to David Igorovich, and Sevolod takes advantage of the death of Yarapolk to have a bit of a reshuffle. Sviatopolk Izyaslavovich is moved from Novgorod to Turov, which had been one of his father's towns. This means that Sevolod can relink Novgorod to the throne of Kiev once again, and he appoints his grandson, Vladimir Monomach's son, Mstislav. So by the end of the 1080s, only Turov and Tmutarakan remain in the hands of clan members who do not acknowledge Sevolod's supremacy. Kiev has restored control over the trade routes, and Sevolod has made himself essentially the sole ruler of Rus, in the same way that Yaroslav did, by managing to live longer than all the other contenders. He did not forget where he had started from and carried out major construction works in Periaslavl. After the death of Yaroslav, it had been very much the junior partner to Kiev and Chernikiv, but Sevolod built churches, monasteries and other public buildings, including the city's first stone buildings. This occasions another long passage in the tale, describing the various doings of monks and bishops. In 1093, Sievelod died on April the 13th and was buried in St. Sophia's. The tale eulogizes both him and Izyaslav. According to the chronicler, Sievelod loved justice, aided the poor, rendered due honor to bishops and priests, loved monks exceedingly, and ministered to all their necessities. He abstained from drunkenness and indulgence and was beloved of his father. The tale once again claims that he was Yaroslav's favorite son and asserts that Yaroslav had always dreamed that Sievolod would be his sole successor, but hopefully without fighting his brothers. Izyaslav, somewhat surprisingly, gets a longer and more detailed send-off. He is described as a man of fair appearance and imposing stature, with a good temper, a hater of injustice and lover of rectitude. He had no guile and did not render evil for evil. The tale laments the hardship the people of Kiev visited upon him and the way his brothers mistreated him, praising Izyaslav for the way he forgave them and ultimately gave his life for his brother. There are a lot of biblical quotes. Izyaslav gets compared to Jesus and the chronicler concludes that he fulfilled the Lord's commandment that he who loves God should love his brother also. This seems pretty generous for an oathbreaker thrown out of his city by his own people because he refused to defend them against a foreign invader. But the chronicler is once again mainly concerned with how these rulers expressed God's will in action. We have no evidence that Sivolod was actually Yaroslav's favourite. The chronicler here seems to be working backwards. Sivolod had become the sole ruler. Rulers were chosen by God. Yaroslav would have agreed with God. Therefore, Sivolod was Yaroslav's favourite. For Izyaslav, his prior sins were wiped away by dying assisting his brother. And it doesn't seem to matter that the thing he was helping them with was killing their nephews. Concluding 
The tale complains that, in his old age, Sivalod came under the influence of malign young advisors. Due to the king's illness, these advisors separated him from his people and kept him ignorant of their corruption. But nothing is really made of this, and the tale quickly moves on to the arrival of Vladimir Monomach and Rostislav, who grieve over their father's weakened state and sit with him as he quietly and peacefully passes. It would appear obvious that Vladimir Monomach, Sevalod's eldest son, should succeed his father. But will his cousins and nephews agree? Join me next episode to find out. Thank you for listening, and until next time, goodbye.